Hi everyone and welcome to this Our Politics of Developing Regions class YouTube lecture. As you know this semester we're going to be having the first session of our um, week uh, via YouTube and this is the first of our uh, YouTube classes although in fact this is week three. So um, let's get started. We're talking about Jeffrey Sachs's book uh, this week, The End of Poverty, which is right here. So I've got you guys reading that and my goal today really is just to give you some insights about the overall context of the book um, so that some of the terms might seem a little less strange for you if you're unfamiliar with some of these terms. Um, I think um, the learning curve can be a little bit steep um, when it comes to talking about economics and development, but this is not an economics class. You're not expected to have a lot of knowledge about economics. This is really a, a, a course that pertains to different theories and critiques of how development uh, is, is put in place politically, uh, what the political stakes of development are, and where we want to go in terms of um, advocating one model of development over another, or perhaps condemning or criticizing the entire ideology of, of development in the first place. And uh, so really, there's a lot of different uh, perspectives that we can uh, analyze here. Um, but Sachs is an interesting chap because um, he's been around for a long time. Um, he's also changed his views, I think, a lot over time. And that's one of the things I want to talk about today. You guys are reading the book, but I want to sort of give you a little bit of background context for it if I can. Um, as you can see here in the image on the screen, we have Bono uh, giving Jeffrey Sachs an awkward hug. Uh, why does Bono play a role in this at all? Well, because Bono, of course, was... Uh, working with Sachs um, on the Millennium Development Goals, which are supposed to be in place and achieved by 2015, although it's not clear at all that that's going to happen. In fact, I think it's unlikely at this stage. But um, the um, relationship between Bono and Sachs is, is an interesting one because it speaks to, well, well I mean, from some people's point of view, uh, it would speak to maybe uh, say more about Bono than anything else because he he's thought of by some people as being sort of a notorious egoist, but um, I, I think that's probably not a main uh, concern for us here. I think for, for better or for worse, Bono has been a major figure in raising um, attention um, and drawing attention to issues of poverty in the world, and uh, so we want to give due attention to uh, his views and, and the reason why he is writing the foreword of the book. Um, but then Sachs himself, of course, um, as someone who would want to um, have some uh, leverage to get his views um, out the door, to make people more aware of, of, of his perspectives and arguments, um, would find it useful to work with someone like Bono who could popularize um, who could popularize his um, his theories and ideas. So Bono, of course, uh, calling Jeffrey Sachs his professor, and then the two of them going on the road together, going around the world promoting the Millennium Development Goals, very interesting sort of turn. But Jeffrey Sachs did not start overnight uh, as a rock star economist. Um, in fact, um, he, was, he was within the economics community regarded um, as quite br brilliant early on. He was a young Harvard economist, one of the uh, youngest they'd ever had. Um, but um, his first claim to fame was rather more controversial. He became uh, associated with the uh, concept of shock therapy, which if you've ever read Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, um, uh, is discussed there. Um, but he administered shock therapy in places like Poland and Russia. And that is an interesting um, uh, 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 part of our story because um, Poland and Russia at the time were just newly uh, sort of post-Soviet, post-communist countries. And what Sachs was trying to do was to figure out a way for these countries to get uh, past some of their economic difficulties and into the modern world uh, economy uh, as quickly as they could. And he argued that rather than a slow transition, it would be better off to try to have some kind of rapid transition. And he tried to put forward um, an argument that would be based on coupling uh, aid with a radical overnight transformation uh, that would privatize a lot of the former state-owned companies and introduce free market principles. Now, of course, 
he says to this day that while it didn't work, it wasn't so much his fault um, uh, that the Western governments never turned up with the aid that was supposed to happen and the privatization was only ever one part of it. Um, so um, that's, that's interesting. But since then, anyway, um, Sachs has had something of a change of heart. He has had adopted in some respects something that might be called more like a Keynesian economics approach, hearkening back to the work of John Maynard Keynes, the famous economist who uh, was working during the Great Depression and World War II to try to engineer a new financial system for the world after the war. Um, Keynes was uh, someone who was turned to by the likes of Franklin Delano Roosevelt trying to plot their way out of the Great Depression um, and realizing that the market, the free market system, uh, often based on or premised on policies or ideologies of laissez-faire, which means it's a French word for let it be, let the market be. Um, so putting forward the idea there really that the more you leave the market alone, the better it is. But of course, those people living during the Great Depression, which many people thought was caused by too much laissez-faire, um, realized that the, um, the, the simple truth was that in a market where people were poor and were no longer buying and selling goods, it didn't matter if you cut taxes and created these pro-market conditions for the producers because people weren't buying what the producers were selling. So how did you? How were you going to get the economy working from the bottom up, so to speak? Well, Keynes argued that really the only thing that you could do was to have the government intervene. Um, and, and, and for many Americans, of course, that sounds like socialism. But for Keynes, the argument was that it wouldn't be socialism, really. It was a very pro-capitalist development. It was just recognizing that capitalism had limitations and, um, and it couldn't always fix its problems. And so if you wanted to fix the problems, you had to sort of step in there with government intervention in the, in the economy, creating jobs, creating government jobs, creating government spending projects, building roads, creating national parks, that kind of thing, things we could all benefit from in the long run. And then um, the uh, economy would recover once the economy had recovered because people were spending with people with these new jobs would be spending money in the local stores again. Once the economy had recovered, the government could take a step back uh, because the private sector would take off and, and employ people um, instead. So that's kind of interesting for us um, that, that, that Sachs seems to have moved more towards that kind of Keynesian sense. And I think perhaps um, that's to do with his um, historical maybe uh, dealings with poverty and realization that you know poverty is not something that can be solved that easily by a sledgehammer approach. Um, uh, in fact, uh, as we'll see in the lecture, uh, the, the further you are to the bottom of the ladder um, of development, um, the harder it is actually to, to develop. So that's an interesting observation um, that we will be discussing in just a moment. Um, Sachs uh, uh, also became very well known during 1997 Asian financial crisis, something that I studied myself when I was doing my master's degree. Um, he and other economists like Nouriel Roubini developed an argument that ran against the popular mainstream opinion at the time, which was that the Asian countries, the Southeast Asian countries, were collapsing because of corruption, because of their Asian way of doing things, and uh, that basically they needed a more radical free market um, type system. But Sachs and others were responding saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, look, these countries have developed into Asian tigers using a very unique model of development over the past 30 years. They have some corruption, sure, but that doesn't uh, take away from the fact that they've done things very uniquely um, in their own way over the past um, 30 years or so, and they've had tremendous success. Um, so we shouldn't um, uh, be too critical of these uh, Asian tigers. Um, what they need is assistance with their debt um, because of course it was a debt crisis and uh, that that is something that even households need from time to time so it's not really fair to sort of write off their entire way of doing things they made some mistakes they they got into some debt uh, much like even in, even the European countries are in today so why would we be so critical of them um, to, to sort of make them change their way of doing things Perhaps that way of doing things is 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 a is an appropriate uh, model for their economic development. So um, so uh, Sachs uh, argued that the situation in Asia was temporary and that these countries should be 
uh, allowed to develop in their own time. Now, the, the subtitle of the book here, by the way, is Economic Possibilities uh, for Our Time, which is kind of, um, I think it sort of uh, echoes an essay written by John Maynard Keynes, who we were just discussing a moment ago. Uh, his essay in 1928 was called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And you can see the sort of parallel in the, in the terms. And I think uh, Sachs is kind of honoring uh, um, um, Keynes in, in using that, um, that, that title. Uh, but what was Keynes arguing in his essay in 1928? He was arguing that, um, you know, by in about two generations, um, uh, we'll basically be able to meet, we'll have the technological means, we'll have the development means in the world to, to meet the basic material needs of all of humankind, that there should be nobody hungry. And of course, here we are, two generations later, and uh, Sachs is writing this book to kind of answer Keynes, I think, in some ways, um, to say, um, you know, well, well, maybe, you know, what would Keynes say if he was here? He would not be impressed because, as we'll argue in the book, uh, one-sixth of the planet's population is, is not even remotely close to being out of poverty yet. They're very, very stuck in their ways, especially uh, the ones in Africa. And so... Um, um, what would Keynes say when he would hear, for example, that worldwide we have about a billion people living on the equivalent of less than a dollar a day, um, which is the official definition of extreme poverty. Two billion people live on less than two dollars a day, which the world's governments consider to be normal poverty. And so even think about that a minute. I mean, this book is about the bottom billion. This book is about the poorest of the poor. But even uh, by government definitions, um, the moderately poor um, are those living um, under two dollars a day. That's not a lot of money. I mean, could you imagine living on two dollars a day? Even in a much, much cheaper part of the world, there wouldn't be a lot you could do or afford to do based on two dollars a day. So, so that's something definitely to think about. So, so this argument, um, this book rather, um, in a way, an effort to try to deal with that, um, takes up the banner of the UN's um, Millennium Development Goals, which were agreed to by 147 heads of state gathered in New York in September 2000. Um, and that's the Development Goals, the Millennium Development Goals came out of a movement that was existing prior to that, um, um, advocated by people like Bono and Bob Geldof and other sort of well-known rock stars. They had big rock concerts to try to advocate this, um, um, which was called the Jubilee 2000 Movement. Um, which was kind of a, a reference, I guess, to the Bible's um, uh, term uh, or, or a reference to the practice or tradition of having a jubilee year once in every 50 years where uh, debts would be forgiven. Because, of course, you know, once debt becomes multi-generational, sometimes there's this argument made that, you know, really what good does it do for people to uh, remain and start their lives and, and for generations to start their lives in debt? Um, and for the rich who are already rich, right, after all, um, what do they need more money for? Um, that, that, that basically debts for the poorest of the poor could be forgiven. Um, now, the goals of the Millennium, of the book and of the Millennium Development Goals are somewhat modest, as we'll discuss. Um, but but uh, Sachs' goals are very, very practical, I think, in some ways. Like he's, his whole argument is to try to um, uh, wean us off... Um, uh, you know, sort of grandiose projects. He's uh, wanting to sort of advocate modest goals like putting mosquito nets out there. And that's something we'll probably discuss in class. But, um, you know, realistically, um, the chances, the, the, the reception of, of some of these goals is has not been that warm. I think uh, among the young people of the world and the activists and the scholars and the students, maybe that it's a, a much more popular uh, reception, but among policymakers, it's been very hard, uh, especially in this time of financial crisis, to to see a lot of these goals being fully implemented. So there's kind of strange free market solutions emerging, where for some of these uh, goals like mosquito nets and that kind of thing, which you know really um, it's not clear that they're uh, effective or um, and, and that they will have much of an impact. Although of course I think uh, in a, it's it's always welcome to see innovation. Um, it sometimes uh, is is a uh, questionable whether um, these things should be uh, uh, put in place without better strategic planning and and, and funding. So, um, of course, now it's important to to recognize that the foreword of the text is written by Bono, uh, Bono who claims that. Um, 
uh, you know, Jeffrey Sachs is his professor and says, in time, his autograph will be worth a lot more than mine. Uh, Bono's views on, uh, on aid, um, uh, on Sachs' views on aid are very, very similar. Um, Bono is uh, basically challenging us, opening the S, opening the book by writing this essay wherein he challenges us to say, to think, you know, like deep down, like if we really accept that their lives, African lives are equal to ours, we would be doing more to put the fire out, right? These, these people are dying, 15,000 people in Africa dying every day because of preventable, dis preventable diseases like AIDS, malaria, and TB. So we have to help, uh, not just for them, he says, says Bono, but also for us, because after all, at the end of the day, it's our security, too, that's on the line here. Um, poverty breeds, uh, at the end of the day, um, many sort of uh, troubling ideologies that the West has to confront in one way, shape, or form, um, like anti-Western sentiment, for example, that might have led to the uh, or, or somehow been implicated in causing the events of 9-11. So um, while the, as Bono observes, while the people that carried out that attack were wealthy uh, people largely from Saudi, Saudi Arabia, the global response uh, from the slums was overwhelming and um, the, uh, the, the, the energy from which the ideology of the Wahhabis draws its, uh, the energy sources from which the ideology of the uh, Wahhabis draws its strength is very much a, 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 a sourced in the in the hearts and minds of the poor. So, um, so what are Bono's solutions? What has his professor uh, taught him? Um, we must achieve the Millennium Development Goals, he says. Uh, we got to make sure that we cut poverty in half by 2015. The real crisis, he says, is that we aren't even remotely aware of this. We're not even really talking about it. We're not even really taking it seriously. Um, in the national media, we're sort of stuck on other things, and um, and this is a global emergency, he says, and 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 we will miss this boat at our peril. So, what would relieving poverty achieve? Um, what, I mean, what would what would what would a better life like these look like for these Africans? Well, you know, in case you think that Bono and Sachs are advocating a kind of a socialism, uh, just be aware that that um, on the lecture circuit. Uh, what Bono's been saying and what Sachs has been saying really is that aid is just a stopgap. This is from a lecture that Bono gave in 2012. Aid is just a stopgap. Commerce and entrepreneurial capitalism take more people out of poverty than aid. Um, so what they're really trying to do, and as we'll see in a minute, they're trying to get people on the development ladder. Once they're on the ladder, of course, capitalism can make a difference. But when people are not even on the ladder, that's when you have the major trouble. And uh, that's that's what uh, Bono and uh, Sachs have been trying to to argue about. So let's talk about this ladder then. Um, some countries uh, like Bangladesh are on the first rung of the ladder. Um, uh, they have been doing better, um, but the bottom billion uh, countries uh, like Malawi um, have uh, been sort of slipping backwards, effectively and they cannot get a foothold on development. That means that their um, governments um, are not uh, drawing in funds and that they are unable to provide basic services for the people. And about a sixth of the planet's population lives in countries like Malawi. Um, so for Sachs, um, the development ladder is, is uh, not really a problem itself. Once you're on the ladder, of course, you can play the game of capitalism and free markets. But if you're not on that ladder, uh, if you're living in a country like Malawi, Really, um, the, the, there are much more basic things that we need to put in place. So, so what is it, what's at stake in describing um, uh, a linear progression, uh, a ladder of sorts, as we've been discussing it here? Um, arguably, um, the 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 plight of people um, to to develop, um, says Sachs, could be thought about as a kind of a, a ladder. He says that every country, in a way. Has on its way to development has to pass through a certain set of stages, and um, he says that virtually every country has developed that has developed successfully has gone through these first stages of industrialization, and that's on page twelve. Um, what happens in a country like Bangladesh, uh, which has got itself at the first rung of the ladder, and is standing on its own now? Um, well, uh, you can see how um, the growth in that country has benefited the people quite tremendously, not just in terms of their wealth, but in terms of their consciousness, he says. 
especially look at the condition of women in, in Bangladesh. Uh, they want fewer children now and things like this. So that means that they're thinking more about their um, their their sort of prosperity and they're living happier lives uh, because people in very very poor countries one of the few things that they can do to guarantee their economic security their pension plan if you will is to have a lot of children um, and of course that means that that you're dealing a lot with a very young population child mortality rates are very very high um, a country that is uh, more developed one of the indications of that development is that people start to have fewer and fewer children because they start to focus on the quality of life of the children that they have, um, not, the, uh, not looking to their children as a type of pension fund for the future. Uh, Sachs discusses that countries like India and China are much, much further up the ladder, and in a way we don't have to worry about them so much, but 93% of the world's extreme poor, he argues, live in East Asia, in South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. In Asia, uh, the numbers are decreasing, but in Africa, uh, he says the numbers are rising in absolute terms and as a share of the population. So that means obviously the, the, the real numbers are, are increasing, but also the percentage of people who are extremely poor in countries like Malawi is increasing. So what are these UN development goals then? Um, uh, they are very modest in some ways. I mean, these are um, kind of basic uh, um, types of things that we would, I presume we would all want for all human beings on the planet, you know, halving the numbers of extremely poor and halving the numbers of the hungry by 2015, um, th those seem to be quite modest, um, you know, certainly we're not discussing eradicating extreme poverty, uh, so this is just reducing them by 50%. Achieving universal literacy in primary education, making sure that everyone knows how to read and that everyone has at least a primary education, promoting gender equality and the empowerment of women. Reducing child mortality by two-thirds, improving maternal health, uh, combating AIDS, uh, HIV, uh, malaria, and other diseases, which are basic uh, killers in these areas. And without them, people would have more peace of mind and would be able to get on with the business of uh, you know, making a living for themselves without worrying about their uh, health or without having worries about their health hanging over them. Um, another objective is ensuring environmental sustainability, that this development does not come at the cost of the environment, but also recognizing, I think, that a sustainable environment, a healthy environment, is also healthy for the people that live near, the, near it. Um, creating a global partnership for development, bring, making sure that the leading agencies in the world, the international organizations like the IMF and the World Bank, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the private enterprises, the private corporations, and the governments, are all sort of in bed together, uh, working together to know so that each hand knows what the other is doing and that they can coordinate their efforts in trying to make sure that there's development. So, so what does Sachs argue? That, that achieving these goals, he says, is not too difficult. It, it seems expensive when you think about it in pure terms because he says it's going to be about 80 billion uh, a year over the next 10 years to achieve the goal. But he says that's not really a lot when you think about the size of worlds the world's economic output, which is about 35 trillion. So 80 billion out of a global GDP of 35 trillion is not too much. He says it's equal to about 20 hours of our annual global economic activity, right? Um, so it's 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 not even a day's worth. It's it's not even quite one day's worth of our of our whole economic turnover on a yearly basis. Um, in fact, uh, 80 billion, he says, is worth about the income of the 400 richest U.S. taxpayers. Um, and that's not even counting the rest of the world's rich. So it's not exactly like this is a hit and run on the on a Robin Hood attack on the world's uh, elites. Um, this is something much more modest. Um, but it says a lot, I think, uh, about Sachs's goals and the UN Development Goals that even these goals uh, have not proven to be very achievable. Um, uh, they um, in in the current political environment. I mean, American politicians uh, really uh, sort of criticize, many of them criticize, especially in the Republican Party, are very critical of um, these sorts of strategies and plans. Um, so some would say, uh, like people like Stiglitz, who we'll be looking at uh, later in uh, this semester, that Sachs is being a bit naive because of this. This is sort of inability to recognize the political reality. Um, it means that he's a bit naive. Institutions like the IMF um, after all, really, the, these international organizations, what really do they do except act uh, uh, at the whim of the world's most powerful nation states? 
So, in a sense, they are the main enforcement mechanisms for the maintenance of the world's financial status quo. Um, they are only going to do what the elites of the richest nation states, ri richest nation states, will want them to do. And so that does sort of mean that we have to think about um, not just how to implement these goals, which, which you know, no one's knocking the goals, but uh, the political reality of implementing these goals, and you know, because clearly they are failing. I mean, the UN Millennium Development Goals are not working. They're not being implemented, um, and they're not being achieved. Um, and that's just because of lack of political will. So really, one of one criticism of the book is that it just doesn't have a strong enough advocacy for a political change, and it doesn't have a good strategy in place for thinking about how to create a political change. So I just wanted to conclude um, this uh, lecture by talking a little bit about um, Jeffrey Sachs as a person, um, and to sort of posit uh, just for you because I'm obviously you're reading the book but you don't see maybe some of the other things he's been talking about um, he started off as a development insider he's an economist uh, university trained and and well admired academic uh, economist but um, he has also uh, started to achieve uh, more of a sort of a public advocacy persona over the years his profile has shifted a little bit and so he was very critical, for example, of the American war in 2003, the invasion of Iraq. Um, he said some things that economists generally have avoided uh, saying. Um, and uh, so he was critical, for example, of American alliances with Middle Eastern despots just in order to keep the oil flowing. He said the world will not tolerate unilateral control by a country that accounts for less than 5% of humanity. Uh, and the American people will end up paying a high price for the fantasy of hegemony. Uh, this idea, of course, that there's a kind of a hubris um, on the part of American uh, foreign policy planners. Uh, maybe some people would, would argue that this hubris is adequately demonstrated in the current debate about whether America should intervene in Syria or not. Um, but, uh, you know, can America go around continuing to think that it is the number one country on Earth and that everybody on Earth wants to be like Americans um, you know, clearly that's not true. Clearly, America's standing in the world is declining, um, especially after 9/11. Uh, and America's the way America responded to 9/11. So, um, is America going to, you know, be able to uh, both go it alone if it retreats from world affairs? It wants to go it alone, but you know, in order to go it alone, it will need to to still have access to oil. And um, right now, the mode of, of uh, engaging with the oil, production, oil producing countries is very sort of pushy. And um, the, uh, the, the reality is that the people in those countries are probably not uh, very content um, to sort of sit around passively unless the, uh, the rules of the game be shaped for them. Um, they will eventually sort of want to uh, take matters in their own hands. So there you go. That's it for today, folks, and I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye.